Good morning. Today we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 6 through 13. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me through 40 years, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. No, Children's Church. I thought you said we have it, and I'm like, I don't see any movement. Sorry, I misunderstood. Can you hear me? On? Okay, start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you that we have an open conduit to you through the blood of Jesus Christ and the Spirit, Lord, that we can cry out to you as Father. Lord, open our hearts and ears to hear your word today, to apply it to our lives. Lord, we're going over and you know exactly where we are, the story of the Good Samaritan, Lord, but it's so much more than what most people realize the story is. Help us not to only be a Good Samaritan, but help us to be like Jesus in this world. So, Lord, we pray that the Spirit speaks to us today as we hear your words and it doesn't fall on hearts that are hard, but soften our hearts to hear your words and let it impact your words so that we don't sin against you and that we are your hands and feet in this world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I entitle this, you got it up there? Who is not a good Samaritan? And yeah, you put the question mark. I don't think it came out with uh, the question mark. Before we get into that, I want to make one little announcement, and I don't want to distract from anything. I'll let the grapevine do its job because it does it well sometimes. But if you have any questions, ask Sherry and I about the house that we bought. Okay? But I don't want to detract from this because this is the importance. But uh, you can find out from other people or you can come directly to either one of us and we'll tell you what all that means. But today we're going to answer the question, who is not a good Samaritan? Okay? Are you a good Samaritan? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because if you raise your hands, I'm going to slap them. (laughs) Because none of us did what the good Samaritan did that day. He went way beyond what we call being a good Samaritan today. And the story's not about being good. It's about the only one who can be truly good, and you want to come to Jesus Christ or not. And it, the question was answered even that way. So I'm going to start out with John chapter 12, as I always usually go somewhere else, just to confuse you. John chapter 12, verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the words of, the, of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, He, God Himself, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light... So that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one whom rejects me. 
and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them in the, at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So here we are in Luke's gospel. We're in chapter 10. Remember the letter doesn't have chapter breaks or anything there, you know, in the original writing. And Luke wrote this gospel so that you would know what you believe as a follower of Jesus Christ. Where John wrote his gospel so that you might believe. You've made a profession that you believe in Jesus Christ and that you have been answered the, the invitation Jesus has given you to follow him. Are you? You've studied all up through this point, and Jesus has sent out 72. He sent out the 12, and then the 72. The 72 came back rejoicing. The demons even submitted to them. But Jesus said, don't rejoice for that reason. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Are you on the page in Luke's gospel where we're coming to? Are you on the page of realizing you are not a good Samaritan? There are none righteous, no, not one. And only by, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, can you be saved. And then if you are, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And you can begin by the power of the Holy Spirit and the transforming Word of God to live more like Christ in this world. But I doubt very seriously even, you might, that you'll get to the example that Jesus gave of this good Samaritan with how much he did for his enemy. Am I living as though I believe? So when you hear the call of Jesus, which the scripture told us about this morning, the songs told us about this morning, you better answer. You better hear and answer Jesus. Is there anything in your life more important than Jesus? At the end of the previous chapter, we said, saw that Jesus even said, all the things of home which are a blessing from God are not to be more important to me, than me. And if you even put your hand to the plow and longingly look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> so many times, though, this parable is wrongly interpreted, and that's why I even changed the title from what you normally hear. It's normally called the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we focus on the good that the Samaritan did. And I listened to several sermons this week, and I listened to one from a highly known, I'm not going to say his name, um, evangelist, and at the end of the sermon he said, now what it's all about is for you to do good, do good, and do more good each and every day, and that is not what this parable is about in even the closest, remotest sense. It's about a religious leader that came to Jesus and said, how must I inherit eternal life? And Jesus turned the tables on his hypocrisy. So if you sit here today and say, I'm doing a pretty good job, the first thing you need to do is get on your feet before Jesus and <laughs> confess that sin. Now, again, I'm not saying that you're not saved by any means, not pointing anything to that. I'm saying that Jesus has to be your everything and the power that you do live a good life and you continue to stumble and fall. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That it's all because of Jesus. And this man came to test Jesus. <clears throat> So I, again, I'll iterate the title, Who is Not a Good Samaritan? And I answered that before, that all have sinned, and I am definitely not a good Samaritan. I am a dirty, rotten sinner saved by grace. Praise Jesus Christ. Many Christians profess and try hard and fall on their works of righteousness, but it's Jesus and Jesus alone, not Jesus plus. I hope you have works of righteousness, because in the Bible it says elsewhere that that's the proof of your repentance. But if you consider this, you might have a little better understanding going into this second parable in Luke. Maybe you look to see how many parables there are, and some uh, lists of parables, they all vary because we have different uh, definitions that define these parables. You might say, well, what about the, the Jesus talking about the wineskins or anything else? But if you look at the true definition of a parable, the first one is the sower who went out to spread his seed. And one of those seeds fell on those of noble heart that produced a crop. If, if Luke is writing this gospel to those who are listening that are those, this second parable should speak much of their hypocrisy, especially when Jesus says, you need to give it all to, up to follow me. And John has just previously said, hey, do you want us to rain down fire from heaven on who? Samaritans of all people. Parables are stories to further teach those who have been enlightened. 
So if you don't have understanding, the first thing I would say is check to make sure that you've been enlightened. Because at the same time, they become even more mysterious to those who have not been enlightened. That's from Jesus' own words. God is the one who gives understanding, and as we read in the scripture from John, he even blinds others. We know these to be proof from further uh, scriptures you can look at and everything, but it's hard to swallow sometimes that God himself does call everyone, and God does blind some of those who harden their heart. He gave Pharaoh plenty of opportunity to change his mind, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart to the point where God hardened his heart, and there was no more chance left for Pharaoh. Read the scripture if you don't follow me there. All sinners, all are sinners, all deserve God's wrath, but because Jesus Christ took that wrath from you, you can be saved, you can be righteous, you can be called a child of the Most High. It is all because of Jesus. Just as Jesus said on the road to Emmaus, all Scripture points to Him and all parables point to Jesus. If you come up with another conclusion than how they point to Jesus, you ought to go back and look at that parable again. <clears throat> the gospel has come in kingdom form. So will you repent? Will you accept the gospel, Jesus Christ, and nothing else? And will you follow after Jesus, denying yourself and taking up your cross wherever that leads you in life, whenever it leads you in life? Will you do that? If the seed is the starting point and it's been planted in your noble heart, then this second parable is about a good Samaritan. What was the reason or purpose that Jesus taught in parables? I'll say it again. Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 8, Still other seed fell on good soil. I, it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. Secrets from the kingdom of God have been given by someone else to you, by God himself to you. But to others I speak in parables. Listen to this part. So that... Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. God is the one who gives that to you. If you have that, count it a blessing. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because you are a child of God. And it is your responsibility to be a light to others because you don't know who God has called and who has opened their eyes and their ears to hear. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the first parable. The seed is the word of God. Jesus even gives the meaning there of that parable, and it sets up the further parables. At the end of, uh, at the end of last week's sermon, where I'm going to start today in Luke chapter 10, verse 21, after the 70 or 72 disciples return and they're rejoicing, and Jesus tells them, don't rejoice in anything of this world, even casting out demons. Instead, rejoice that your name is written in heaven, because that's something you cannot do. You can't write your name there. Only Jesus Christ can, because God has revealed it to you, just as he said that God had revealed to Peter who he was. So verse 21, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things, there it again, from the wise and the learned. So when you think you know so much about the Bible and everything, you better look back again and see if it points to Jesus. Because everybody in Israel did not accept, everybody I'm using again as the majority, did not accept Jesus as Messiah, even though prophecies clearly pointed to him. They were expecting something different because of the way they interpreted it. So I, if you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children, those who with, with pure and honest faith come and trust God. Have you come to Jesus with that kind of faith? Yes, Father, this is what you're pleased to do. Verse 22, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and to those whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Again, it is a gift of God given to you, and if you receive that gift, you better be using it, praising God for it, shining your light brightly, because it is the most incredible gift ever given. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, 
but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. But don't take that because you've got knowledge that kings and prophets don't even have. And don't take that and be proud. Instead, let it humble yourself. That means you've got to live a life of self-denial. Take up your cross and follow after Jesus. Who am I then? Who are you then? Are you a believer? Are you a disciple? Are you a follower? Are you a Christian? That term is so watered down in our country today. It means like Christ. If I think I'm like the Good Samaritan, proudly enough and vainly enough to say that, that's far from being like Christ even. He gave up heaven to save you, to suffer and die for you. Are you like Him? Then you should pray to the Lord of Harvest to send out workers, and then you should go and answer those prayers. Go and tell of salvation through Jesus Christ today because judgment comes later. And while you're doing that, rejoice because your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. Because no matter what you suffer, wherever you have to go, your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. So have you signed up for this? Because if you haven't signed up for this, your name, Jesus hadn't signed in the book of life. That's what Luke has written so far. So I'm going to start digging into that. Again, saying that the seed fell in the first parable on those who with noble hearts heard retained, and by persevering, produced a crop. Second parable, then. Are you loving God and loving others? Because that was the answer given. 1 John 4.20 says, Whoever does not love their brother whom they can see cannot love God whom they cannot see. So maybe a religious expert can tell us more. <laughs> no, we can look at a religious expert and see how far from the kingdom of God he really is. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, now I will say here, depending on what your translation says, it wasn't necessarily happenstance. Another big topic, and I don't want to go down that rabbit trail, but God is sovereign in all things. I also want to say that this is a story. It's a story. It's not a real event. Okay? But God is in control of all things. Take all that into your mind and process it. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, this part is, is real, so don't let me change the topic here. He was there that day for whatever reasons, just like you're there whatever day. Some days you realize that, some days you don't. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? There's our question. You know the answer. It's all throughout Scripture. Believe. That's the answer, right? Well, not what we see Jesus say here or the man say right here. Jesus' answer to this question was, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus gave this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to, tell, to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down, through the, down the same road. And when he, a man passed, he passed, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. When he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hand of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now I read, I think, from the NIV. A lot of times I copy and paste from the Berry and Study Bible, but we have the NIV in the pew, so I try to do that. Yours may say a little differently, but the, the message is still the same. There's a real encounter with a man. It's not by happenstance, because God is divine. There's a parable about some men, and probably in that you could definitely apply that things don't happen by happenstance, so Jesus isn't saying that these things are happenstance again. They're in God's design of all things, that He's sovereign, and the whole purpose from, 
from creation to ending is glorifying himself through Jesus Christ and bringing you to salvation so that you glorify him. Let me remind you of Luke's words of Jesus. Though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may see and not hearing they may not understand. God gives you sight or He does not give you sight. Have you responded to that call? Are you seeing clearly or do you need to have Jesus do a little more work there? Do you realize that your life was purchased by Jesus Himself to be like Him in this world. Yes, everything else that is good, families, everything else, that's why Jesus wasn't saying you have to get rid of your families. You don't have to sell all of your wealth like the other story that we have and to go follow Jesus, but He has to be first. He has to be Lord. If you believe in your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, so is He so that you don't fall in the category of those seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. The understanding of all parables, as with all scriptures, point to Jesus, period. And parables are given in a way where you either stay in the darkness because you've been blinded, or you come to more light so you can have more further teaching illustrations of how to live for Jesus once you have responded to Jesus. So as an expert of God's law. He knew it to and from. He had the first five books at least of the Old Testament memorized. I cannot even fathom that. But he came to Jesus to test him that day. Luke tells us that. You don't have to wonder why he came to Jesus. The young rich ruler that came and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to go sell everything. Did not seem to come with that intent. He came to seem with the intent, I want to follow you, Lord. But then Jesus hit him where his heart was and that was on his pride and his money and his power and whatever things it was but this man came to test Jesus and he asked specifically this question what must I do to inherit eternal life isn't that really everybody's question when I die what's going to happen to me even if I say I'm going to be nothing but worm food afterwards do, do I not ever have thoughts that there might be something besides that and if I do I've got to wonder will I make it I want to justify why there's not a hell because I can't think of that comprehension of it. But in this comprehension in Israel, eternal life meant pure shalom, peace that surpassed all understanding. It meant being and dwelling with God. It didn't just mean, okay, I'm going to go to nirvana or, or some other place or you know whatever. We're going to a place that is a new creation. The old has passed away. Everything, not just us, but all of creation where we're fully saturated by the Holy Spirit to live holy lives, praising God. You know, before I understood that, I thought, we're going to get bored in heaven praising God all the time. And now I'm like, no, I won't. <laughs> Not for the great things He has done. And I've got to build that boat so that my family sees it, my church sees it, because I want them there with me so that I'll never stop praising Him. And I don't have to understand why some people are called and other people don't call. That's in God's sovereignty. But I do need to play my part. I do need to be a light. I do need to be a sheep listening to his voice, and he has called me to be a shepherd as well. <clears throat> no one can do anything to inherit eternal life. The whole question is an oxymoron. I don't do anything for an inheritance. An inheritance is given to me usually because I am a child. I don't do anything. I didn't give myself birth into this family. I cannot do anything to inherit eternal life. So the question itself, when I come with that attitude, I need to get before the cross and ask for forgiveness and say instead, thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing it for me. Jesus has already told us that all we need to do is believe. That's the correct answer. <clears throat> Nothing I can do will escape me from God's wrath and eternal punishment. Jesus could have said, believe in me, but he didn't here because the parable has a different purpose. Instead, verse 26, he says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? All right, now the question's back with a question. 
I listened to one sermon by R.C. Spool. He said, you know, Jews are always answering questions with questions. He said, why do they do that? He said, for years I wondered. And he said, and I come up with the answer. Why not? Get it? Another question. <laughs> but Jesus so many times turned that question back to ourselves so that it would expose our heart. Because you know in your heart what you, what you think and believe. Let, let's just get it out there on the table. Jesus already knows it. What's written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he's put two things together in here, and I'm not going to go that far in it because I want to concentrate a little more on the parable. But he's caught, he, puts, he put Deuteronomy and Leviticus together. He's tied the Old Testament laws, which we sometimes think are cumbersome about all these things, but they're about even the Ten Commandments. How we relate with God so that we can relate with others. This relationship and this relationship. I look a lot like this cross behind me, don't I? Because you're never going to have, if you don't have a right relationship to Jesus Christ, you're never going to have a right relationship with here. Not even honoring your mother and father. And you're not going to have it by, without means of the cross because Jesus came and died for your sins. But that is the correct answer if you could live by the law. That's the answer. All I've got to do, this is all I've got to do to inherit eternal life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, I just had a bad thought about somebody. I just failed. No one can keep God's law. That is the correct answer, but I can't do it. Paul even said if it wasn't for the tenth commandment, <laughs> how do you get past the first nine making check marks? But if it wasn't for covetousness, I wouldn't have understood the law and what a wretched sinner I am. I, I, I ponder how P Paul made it all the way to ten. Jesus' answer, though, is you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Oh, that should have condemned the man right there. I cannot do this. I have given a correct answer in theory, but I can't do this. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory standard. He didn't have that verse yet, but he had five books of the law. He knew them. The answer is correct if anyone can do it, but no one can. So that brings me to condemnation and draws me to another solution which was standing right before him, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And all the signs had pointed to this. He knew this man was from God, but he came to test him. The ex ex expert of the law had an extreme amount of head knowledge, but the seed was not planted in his heart. See the building of the scripture here? If the seed was planted by re retaining it, by persevering, it would have produced a crop. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he goes a step forward. That didn't bring him any condemnation. Now he wants to justify himself. Again, he knows all the law, so he knows who his neighbor is. The neighbor is the foreigner. The alien is, as Sherry uh, read the scripture this morning. The neighbor means that guy from a foreign land. Now, yes, in the Old Testament, God destroyed many nations because he called to do that. But he also saved Rahab out of a fallen nation. And that's, she's in Jesus' lineage. His, his purpose is to draw men, but when he says it's too late, it's too late. If you hear the words of God today, you better respond. Back to Luke chapter 6, just so it's refreshing in our mind. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. There we go. Maybe that religious expert was there that day. I don't know. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other one also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold the shirt from, your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to the others as you would have them be done to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do, not, if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because, it, because He is kind and grateful. He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Now, maybe that religious expert wasn't here that day, but that's all Jesus expounding on the law again. The reason that all of these things were written, if your ox falls in a hole, if this happens, if that happens, they were all written for this reason, and this man was an expert in the law. He was the one the other lawyers went to and said, how do you read this in Scripture? 
But he wanted to justify himself and said, who is my neighbor? He knew that question. But because of the hardness in your heart, who is your neighbor? Why do you have any that you would call enemies and have animosity in your heart? This is not a parable about doing good, about being a good Samaritan. It's a parable like all other parables meant to draw you to Jesus for salvation and then draw you to Jesus to live like Jesus, a standard much higher than the good Samaritan. The word Samaritan also is a horrible word in that day. It's equivalent to devil. They hated their half-brothers. You can look back in history again and see why it was justified. They, they, they stood there and watched them being destroyed. They, they hated them so much they walked around the area of Samaria to get to their redneck brothers. I put those words in there. In, in Galilee, which is a condemnation already that I think that way lower of the ones that I call my brothers and sisters. But the Samaritans on the other they worshipped on a different mountain, they, everything else. They were scum, and John in the previous chapter with his brother James said, let's rain down fire from heaven and destroy them. That's not very Christ-like, is it? In John chapter 8, verse 47 to 51, Jesus' words, Who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. So you didn't hear the regular words of Jesus. You're not going to understand the parables for sure. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? That was not a good word. Now the irony in all that is when you hear Samaritan today, you think of the word good. <laughs> And that's what the Christian life should be. Something flipped upside down because I once was blind and now I see. The total opposite of what you were before, even if you were good, that now you are Christ-like because you're a new creation. Jesus' answer there in John chapter 8 is, I'm not possessed by a demon, Jesus said, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is a judge. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my words will never see death. There's your answer again for eternal life. If you believe, if you are a sheep, if you are a child of God, you listen to the voice of the shepherd. If you're a child of God then you have started that road to understanding the Good Samaritan is just a point in understanding more about being like Jesus. And you've got to have that compassion, and you've got to do it or you're not there. Just like James was probably the first letter written to the churches in the New Testament saying, I don't believe your faith because I don't see it in your actions. But he wanted to justify himself. Now I've got to ask my qu question to me, how many times do I justify myself in answers about stuff like this, especially when I'm reading God's Word? And I read that part about turning the other cheek or whatever it is or lend without expecting to be returned. And I say, well, you know, I, I would, but... So I have to examine myself and say how close I am to the religious expert here. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus then, who is my neighbor? There's this question. So now the parable that's coming is an answer to how much I inherit eternal life, but we don't need to take that out of context because we know how to really inherit eternal life, believe in Jesus Christ. We know that, that the answer is also that, yes, if I could obey the law, but I can't. Now we've got the question also that the parable will answer, who is my neighbor? And that has to put a question to me then because of how the parable is laid out. Am I being neighborly? There's where it's going to convict you if you're a child of God. What happens when you see this person? Are you even close to what the Good Samaritan did? A parable comes, which is further teaching illustration. For those who hear, they hear and understand, and it changes them. For those who don't, it blinds them further. A man was going down, the road, down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So we've got a real-life scene, but a fictitious story. So Jesus is probably saying that this wasn't just happenstance, but that's not really important. It's however you view it. The road to, from Jerusalem to Jericho was down, and it was carved out with, um, and it, even up until the early 1900s was a place you didn't go at night. It was for 2,000 years before Jesus and nearly 2,000 years after Jesus. This is a place you didn't want to go because robbers were there because there were hillsides where people could hide in crevices and attack 
attack uh, uh, vulnerable people. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. Now, we don't know who this man is at first, but as we read, we can understand this. And if you study Scripture, you can go back to Joshua 15.7 or Joshua 18.7 and see the name of this area mentioned. It literally means a pass of blood because the place was so dangerous, so many people were killed there that you better be careful traveling through there. And like I said, I took it back to the time of Joshua. These robbers, they, they're multiple ones, stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, you can assume they robbed him at the same time they were called robbers and everything. You can put those assumptions in there, but it's not really important to the story. You've got a guy that is laying on the side of the road half dead, and people encounter him. What do they do? A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, you've got to take Jesus' spiritual interpretations of any parables as well. So if this man is dying physically, what's going to happen to his eternal soul? It's already mentioned in the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And as an expert in the law, aren't you supposed to tell others so that they can come to eternal life? So a priest happened by, he's the one that should definitely have done something, right? And he goes to the other side of the road. The word is intentional. Okay, I can start going into the issues of why. Really? What does the why matter in the story? It doesn't change the man's condition. Oh, he might have been going to the temple and would be defiled. Okay. So don't go there. Don't beat yourself up with all those whys and stuff because they don't matter to the story again. You're going to get sidetracked if they do. The point is a priest, the one that should have helped the most walked to the other side. He should have been the hero of the story, not the nasty Samaritan. He saw the man, he did not see him, and he deliberately went to the other side of the road. How many times do I see that person and avoid them on the road? Hmm. Verse 32, So too, so also, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Well, now if I were trying to justify myself... That's why I wouldn't ask the questions why the priest didn't go. Then I'd still be justifying myself here because that's the real motive of me asking why because there's got to be some reason that that priest didn't. I would go to the Levite and say, well, he probably didn't have the same concerns that the priest had and surely he would help. He's a man of God. Well, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. I don't know what your translation says, but it implies that he looked at him. He gazed upon him. He didn't just like, oh, let me go avoid him. He was like, oh, man, well, I'm not going to, whatever the reason is. That's how Jesus lays out this story. So the pastor didn't help, but the music leader should. Sorry, sweetheart. <laughs> Sorry, Debbie. I mean, that's where we're at in the story. But a Samaritan, complete contrast, but means the exact opposite, a Samaritan. Now, everybody in the crowd that day at this point went, oh, what's he going to say about the Samaritan? Whether they were Samaritan or whether they were a Jew, what are they going to say? And by this time, you should be figuring out that the man was a Jew. It's obvious from the story. It's never said, but it's obvious. He was a fellow citizen because it wasn't put in the story at this point. It was a Samaritan laying over there. It was a Jew. The Jew was the enemy of the Samaritan. The Samaritan was the enemy of the Jew. And we constantly did this all the time because we never ever decided that we shouldn't. We always wanted to be this way. We always had this animosity in our heart because he did, she did, and that's just where it went. But a Samaritan, as he traveled... And the word implies he had a place to go. He wasn't just happenstance. He had a journey he was going to. Work, whatever it was. We don't know, maybe his temple. Who knows? He came where the man was. That implies that the man was directly put in his path. It is not happenstance if you study the words. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. The word's compassion. The word is what drove Jesus to compassion to feed the 5,000 and said, here, you do it. The word, the word is what drove Jesus to compassion to say they are like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion is something that because of the state of the person, you have a feeling down in your bowels that they need help. 
And because it's not happenstance that you're there, because it's on their path, because you know God's sovereign, or if it is happenstance, if you don't believe that way, but they still put in your path, what am I going to do with this compassion that is eating me up in the bowels of my stomach? Am I going to do nothing? Am I going to go home tonight and say, yeah, honey, I saw um, this man on the side of the road, and, and her asked me, well, why didn't you help? Well, well, I knew you had dinner plans tonight. It doesn't matter what the reason is. It matters of what are you going to do with the compassion you have. And if you didn't have compassion, and we don't know that the priest or Levite did, shame, 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 shame on you. How can you look at a person created in the image of God, no matter where they're at, in their sinful, fallen state, and not have compassion if they're half dead? If you, are, if you don't have compassion, you're completely dead, spiritually. What did he do? He went to him. Wait a minute, the robbers might have still been there. This ain't my job. He's a, dirt, he's, a, he's a dirty Jew. I could have come up with a million reasons not what, but there's nothing here that he did. He immediately, when he saw him, he had pity, he went. Boom, boom, boom. Immediate responses. He bandaged his, his wounds. Where did he get the bandages from? Did he rip his shirt, his cloak off and, and use them? I don't know. Pouring on oil and wine. There's, there's cost involved. Then he put the man, and we could go in deeper, but it's not necessary for the story. You know, why oil? Why wine? No, go, just listen to the story. Then he put his man on his own donkey. That means i got to walk. If he's bloody and nasty, i got to clean the blood off the donkey and everything else. If he's a nasty Jew, I need to wash the donkey just for that reason. Right? If that's the thing I have. But this man doesn't seem to have any of that. He brought him to an end. There's more cost again. And he took care of him. He continued to stay with him when he could have given the burden to someone else at this point. Why? Well, I have to comprehend and say, well, it has to be because he wasn't ready to leave the man yet. He was in such bad health, dire straits, that he said, no, I'm going to stay with you till you're okay. And he does till he, then he passes on the burden to someone else. Because if you keep reading, the next day, that means he spent the night with him. Whether he stayed in the same room, he got a different room, we don't know what the costs were involved there. But we know he had a journey to go on that day, and he did not make it that day to his journey. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. So he took out more money. That's two days' wages. Well, that, that seems fine. Um, a hotel stay today it will cost you how much? Average wage, it'll cost you two days' wages to stay a day. But in that day, that would have let the guy stay for a month or two because they weren't driven by greed and <laughs> profit. They were driven by making a living and providing a service. So he gave the man enough to keep him for at least two weeks to put that time period out there. That gives the time for the man to heal. There's someone there. And he says to the, to the innkeeper, look after him. He's given him the responsibility. And when I return, now I'm going to make a return trip. I'm going to spend more time. Oh, and more money. I will in reverse, reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. That's an open invitation to extortion, is it not? Wow. Now I ask the question again. Are you like the Good Samaritan? <laughs> no. I have never been that gracious to someone in my life. The hardest thing would have probably been even following up with them, speaking truthfully from myself. Because I know now i got to go take the time. The money's easier than the time for me. That finding time to go, that, to, to be, to go out of your way takes compassion and God's grace. Would it be worth it to do all that? Would you consider the cost of that? Or would you consider that joy to do that? And this man is your enemy. And why did he do it for that man? So that he would live. Physically. But isn't your job so that people will live spiritually? I mean, I know you want your children to live physically, but you want them to live eternally. So you better want to be like the Good Samaritan. You better let that be a, a trampoline bounce to, to being like God, which means deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him. Have you ever, ever obeyed this much, the Scriptures? How about towards your enemy then? Can you come out with a time when you saw your enemy lying there? 
Even if you said someone else will do it, Lord, you know I got a place to go today. I just happened by here. Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. This is after God made his case against his children, whom he'd redeemed from the land of Israel. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? I can't do anything to inherit eternal life. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require? To act just, justly and to love mercy and walk humbly before your God. Isn't that what the Samaritan did? He did what was just. He provided justice to the man. He gave mercy. Mercy is giving something that the man doesn't deserve necessarily because the, the, the compassion that he has and walking humbly before his God. Doesn't say that here, but he had to have some reason that he lived that way. But yet, like I said, this life to attain salvation, no one can do it, not even the good Samaritan. Let me remind you again that Samaritan was associated with evil. The Samaritan was associated with wrong religious beliefs. And yet here Jesus flipped it upside down and, and said, not only is this guy your neighbor answering that question but this guy is ten times more neighborly even to his enemies be careful that you don't have head knowledge like the expert and don't have heart knowledge like the Samaritan doesn't imply the Samaritan was saved that's nothing to do with the, the story again the story is a religious expert came to test Jesus said what must I do to inherit eternal life Jesus said obey everything and love your neighbor and the guy put those two together. He didn't give just the love of the Lord your God. He put in the neighbor part. So then he wanted to justify himself by saying, well, who is my neighbor? Which he knew the answer to again. And Jesus gave him this story by the enemy becoming the hero of the story, so to speak. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that means I want to know that I have eternal life. And the religious expert knew all the right answers, but did not have eternal life life and it was proved in the way that he loved others because you can't love God if you don't love your brother who you see especially in his time of need that should convict you of any time that you see someone in need I'm not saying any time is every time you that's your decisions with God but do you have compassion to take time to take money to take whatever it is to help those who are in need to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world because that's who you're called to be. Verse 36, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? There's a question again to convict my heart if I'm that religious expert and to convict everyone who heard these words. The expert of the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, And go and do likewise. Don't just take this knowledge. Go back and say, I've read my Bible, I've gone to church, I believe these things. If you are hearers of the word and doers only, you do not listen, you do not hear and obey. You have failed the commandments. You will die in your sins unless Jesus Christ has taken them away by being your Savior and your Lord. I can't do anything. Jesus already has done everything. It is my job to believe and be like Jesus. If you understand anything as a Christian, if you're there, first point is to be coming to Christ. Then the second point, if you're already there, that the disciples were doing that day, falls right back to the previous chapter. Lord, do you want us to rain down fire from heaven? No, I want you to be neighborly. I want you to have compassion. I want you to love. Just as your heavenly Father has loved you enough that He would send His one and only Son to die for your sins, that all who believe will not perish, but instead have eternal life. Am I a neighbor? The Bible doesn't tell us the rest of this story. We don't know what happened in the fictitious story or in the story of the experts. As we follow Luke's gospel, we'll see what happened with the 12 disciples. They did give up everything. They did deny themselves. They did follow, take up their cross. 
And they followed Jesus till the cross took their lives. They gave them up to save others. What about your story? Here's where you're at. That's the purpose of Luke's gospel. Where are you at in this story? Am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? The first parable was a seed. Is it sown in my heart? Is it producing a crop? Are weeds choking it out? Do I not have a good root foundation? Where am I at in this story? And it's proven in the way that you love God and love others. Because you have the authority and the power if you have come to Christ. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You are a new creation. Does that mean I won't sin? No. It means again that if I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And that each and every day when I have animosity in my heart, when I don't want to take the time, when I don't want to spend the money, when whatever it is that I want to give excuses, instead I say, Lord, send me. Here I am. Wherever, whenever, because the mission is more important than the missionary. And we're all called to be that light in the world. Is Jesus the life of your story? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this parable. We thank you for Luke's gospel. We thank you that we can be here and hear your words, Lord, and, and let them pierce our heart, dividing soul and spirit, Lord, so that we live abundant lives here and now, Lord, so that we live a life that is a testimony to our children, to our grandchildren, to our parents, to our brothers, sisters, our friends, even our enemies, so that we're not a stumbling block to others, but a light instead. And Lord, I pray that together our lights shine even more brightly. We use the gifts that the Spirit has given us to be a complete body of Christ, not just individual body parts. Lord, I thank you and praise you for all of the good things that you do, that I know that you are sovereign in all creation and that you work out all things together for good to those who love you. Because if we walk by sight rather than faith we'll tend to listen to the words of satan whispering in our ear rather than yours so lord lead us to that quiet place to hear your voice to bring us peace and to know that jesus christ has paid the price of our sins and if we believe in him we are yours we pray this in jesus name amen